Happy Boxing Day. It's time to send back all the gifts that you don't want, including last year's not making the NCAA tournament. Instead, let's start looking ahead to the 2024 tournament where Carolina will be dancing. The question today, for how long? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, December 26, 2023. Happy Boxing Day to those of you that celebrate. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank in particular you everydayers for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listener watch to get your Tar Heels every day. If you're a guest or you're new to the show, welcome into the end of 2023. We're so glad you're here making a New Year's resolution to come be with us all the time. If you'd like to get more in depth with our show, come join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord. The link for that is in the show notes. Coming up on the show today, we are going to look ahead to some bracketology. We're going to have uh, some updates ahead of the football game tomorrow. Remember, tomorrow is Carolina's bowl game. We've got the depth chart for that, so I want to talk about that a little bit. And also got a few more Eric Montross stories, so I want to share those. And also our Trivia Tuesday. Uh, before we get to any of that stuff, though, I, w- I do want to give you a note, kind of a fun thing. Uh, my wife surprised me with a trip to New York City later in this week. My my 40th birthday is next month, and so she told me about it because we're doing it this week during Christmas. So what that means is that I'm actually going to pre-record the rest of the week, meaning I won't have a bowl game wrap till we get back at the end of the week. I'll probably just do something a couple minutes quick on the bowl game, but just wanted to make you aware of that in advance so you don't tune in Thursday and be like, Where's all the bowl game commentary, Shade? What are you doing? Well, I'm going to be hanging out in New York, so I'll get it to you, I promise. Okay, let's start with Trivia Tuesday. For those of you who are new, what we do each Tuesday is I'll give us a trivia question off the top, and then I'll answer it at the end of the show. So here it is. We're going to be talking bracketology today. My goal right now is for Carolina to get a three seed. Would love for it to be higher, sure but I think three seed is a good target. Now, the question is this. North Carolina has previously been a three seed in four different tournaments, one of which, in fact, predates the expansion to 64 teams. So my question to you all today, what were those four years? And bonus question, if you want to get real down and dirty with it, how did Carolina do in those four tournaments? So again, we'll answer that question at the end of today's show. Let's start by getting into bracketology. Thanks to Carolina's work in the non-conference schedule, and I know we've still got Charleston Southern upcoming on Friday, but again, it's on paper the worst team Carolina will play all season, and so let's just kind of go ahead and chalk that up as a victory. Thanks to everything else Carolina has done in the non-conference, they would have to absolutely fall apart in ACC play to not make the NCAA tournament this year. It's great news. That's a relief. I don't know about you, but for me, after what happened last year, I'm just like, okay, okay, we're doing this. We're making the NCAA tournament. Even two years ago, kind of had to sweat it out. So um, that said, that's great news because instead of having to think about not just like, will Carolina make it? We can start thinking about the things that Carolina should be thinking about. The more typical question, not not will they make it, but what seed will they get when they do make it? That's where we want to look at today. So with that in mind, if things ended up today, like if the season was over right now, December 26, I project Carolina would be a high-end five seed. And when you think about like the way the bracket breaks down when you're a five seed, that's no guarantee. I mean, nothing's ever a guarantee anymore that you win even one game. But as a five seed, it's no guarantee that you win a second game. Let's see you beat the 12 team you're playing in the first round. That means you're facing a four seed in the second round unless they get upset. That's that's no easy task to make it to the Sweet 16 right there. So, um Same kind of thing, though. If Carolina bumps up to a four, let's say they beat the 13 seed opposite them in round one, then you got to play a five seed in round two to make it to the Sweet 16. That is, again, 
that is no easy task. That's no given, nothing like that. So I would feel, as I said with Trivia Tuesday, would feel much better if Carolina can bump up several spots to being a three seed. You'd feel much better about that because you get a 14 in round one. And then if the bracket holds a six seed in round two to make it to the Sweet 16. Now, obviously, you'd love to keep going even higher and higher and higher, get a two seed, get a one seed. To do that, you know, Carolina, by virtue of losing to Villanova and not beating at least one of UConn and Kentucky has made it a little bit hard because the ACC isn't necessarily high end. Although Clemson man is, is showing up. So Carolina, we talked about this. I think it was on Friday show as of right now has nine quad one opportunities in ACC play. That's almost half of their ACC games. That's great, but you got to take care of business there. If Carolina does, I believe they will shoot up the up the uh, S curve and have a higher bracketology projection. I'm looking right now at a three seed. I think that would be very attainable, very doable, even allowing for some understandable losses in ACC play to the right teams. You don't want to lose to Louisville for crying out loud or Notre Dame, you know, that kind of thing. But if you have some expected like road losses in some of those quad ones, okay. But if Carolina like really takes care of business in ACC play, no reason they couldn't jump up to a two seed, maybe a one seed, but some things would have to fall the right way. So again, I'm right now looking at, all right, Carolina, as I see it, is a high-end five seed right now. Let's look at getting them up to a three, and that would be great. Now, I want to talk some about where teams are at right now. So we can get an idea of the types of teams that are around the Tar Heels. So I'm going to list out for us the teams right now that are commonly showing up in the three seed line through the six seed line. To help us do that, I'm going to use Bracket Matrix. What Bracket Matrix does is takes uh, 35 different bracketologists and averages out their work. So basically it takes 35 brackets, Averages out, averages out where each team is on those. So on bracket matrix right now, the current three through six seeds are as follows. The three seeds. So this would be teams nine through 12 are Oklahoma, Baylor, BYU, and Illinois. The four seeds are Wisconsin, FAU, just off a massive victory over Arizona. Well done, FAU, honestly. Then Memphis and Creighton. Then the five seeds currently are Carolina as the top five seed, Colorado State, Kentucky, and Auburn. Obviously, Carolina lost to Kentucky. And then the six seeds, Texas A&M, Virginia, Gonzaga, and Alabama. So, so that's kind of the teams in and around the Tar Heels right now. Again, getting up to that three seed is, is doable and attainable, but you got to win. So as I look at some of these different bracketology spots, where does Carolina land? Let me give you um, three of them and then a little more on bracket matrix. Right now, ESPN's bracketology from Joe Lenardi has Carolina as a five seed. However, here's what I need to tell you. Those rankings came out before the Oklahoma game. So you got to think that next time Lunardi puts out a projection, Carolina is going to jump in those. Also, each time the bracketologists put out their information, they typically show who they project right now to be the auto bid from each conference. And right now, Lunardi has Clemson as the auto bid from the ACC, not Carolina, not Duke, not Miami, Clemson. Isn't that interesting? Another one, Bracketville. They do a good job. They have Carolina as a three seed. This is updated after the Oklahoma game. Um, So they have Carolina 12th overall, which would be the last three seed. They also at Bracketville have Clemson as the projected ACC auto bid. Team rankings, which is a very stats data driven uh, website. In fact, if you're interested, they'll send you an email after every game, kind of updating their projections on the team. Right now, they have Carolina as a five seed. That is updated after Oklahoma. They update every day. 18th overall team. That's the second five seed. One of the things they show is what is the projection to get a one through four seed? Right now, team rankings has Carolina as a 41% chance to get a one through four seed. Duke with the best ACC auto bid odds, and they give Carolina a 99% chance to make the tournament. So all of that is great news. And then a little bit more from Bracket Matrix, where I said uh, they combined 35 different bracketologists. 
Um, Carolina is projected in the field for all 35. That's great news. The average seed for the Tar Heels is 4.57. Um, and that might sound like, oh, so they're a four seed, right? Well, no, that's just where they're projected. And then you kind of slot it down. There are four teams uh, ahead of Carolina that all have a four seed designation. So Carolina right now at bracket matrix is landing as the top overall five seed. So 17th overall on the S curve and then the top five seed. Um, at, at, and they show bracket matrix does all the various of those 35 matrix matrices. I guess it would be Carolina's highest at that is a three seed and their lowest is a seven seed. However, of the two brackets where Carolina is projected as a seven seed, both of those were released prior to the Oklahoma game. So I imagine Carolina would jump there. And yet again, at bracket matrix, they have Clemson projected as the ACC auto bid. So the Tigers getting a ton of love. Don't forget, Carolina goes to Clemson for the uh, second game of the main chunk of ACC play. So big, big game there. Okay, where we want to head to next is switching from basketball to football. We've got the bowl game coming up tomorrow. The depth chart has been released, and as you would imagine, uh, based on injuries and, and guys transferring out and opting out because of NFL prep, there's quite a few differences, but maybe not as many as you th would think there might be. So I want to get you updated on all that, and we'll do it in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights and more. Whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part's guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Okay, let's turn our attention to Carolina's bowl game, the Duke's Mayo Bowl. Tomorrow, Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern, the game's on ESPN. And as you're probably aware, Carolina is playing West Virginia. We'll get you more ready specifically for the game on Wednesday show. But again, uh, today I want to talk about the depth chart itself so you can kind of get ready for who you'll be expecting to see. Keep in mind, bowl games are all about, in this day and age, if you're not in a New Year's Six Bowl, if you're not in a college football playoff bowl, it's really, if we're being honest, it's just an exhibition game, but at the end of the season. Uh, this you've heard the coaches talk about it, but it's an opportunity to get early enrollees in. It's an opportunity to get who you think might be next year starters in to see more of what they're going to do. It's all about all the extra practices you get, all of those kind of things. And so um, just keep that in mind. A game of this nature is just icing on the cake at the end of the season. Now, as we turn to next year, and now there are suddenly 12 playoff teams, there are more opportunities to get in big time bowls. And so you want to try to do that. But um, this kind of game is more about just taking advantage of an opportunity given you to get more reps. That's all this is. And fun, right? Uh, thankfully, the game is close for the Tar Heels, obviously just in Charlotte. Uh, West Virginia, I mean, it's not too terribly far for the Mountaineers, but definitely farther than for the Tar Heels. So let's look at the depth chart first off for the offense. Let me take you left to right across the offensive line. The uh, number one, basically, I'll tell you number one on the depth chart for every position. You got Diego Pounds, Ed Montalus, Willie Lampkin, William Barnes, and Spencer Rollin. So you feel good about that. All guys with starting experience, all guys that you're used to seeing on the line. The biggest change there, obviously, is Corey Gaynor is not playing the bowl game. So Willie Lampkin slides over to play center for him. And then you got Monolis and Barnes on either side and expanding out. You got Pounds and Rolland as the tackles. Um, as will be a common refrain throughout the game, the question marks are the depth behind those guys. 
Will Carolina play less depth and really ride their starters in this game? Will they say, hey, it, it's essentially an exhibition game, so let's just rotate it through, see what we got, right? Um, you, you feel kind of interesting about that. Now, as you go to running back, I'm like, great. You got a Marion Hampton behind a pretty standard line for what Carolina is used to. And then two and three behind him are British Brooks and Caleb Hood. I would imagine, I would imagine that because like, I would think Carolina would get more reps for British Brooks, more reps for Caleb Hood. Um, not that you don't want to ride Omarion, but you just don't want to put too much mileage on a running back's legs. You want to have every possible chance for him to be ready. Omarion, that is, to do everything he needs to do next year. So you just don't want to, you don't want to risk it, you know? Um, but I, I, so I imagine all three running backs will get some work. Now, where it gets wacky on the offense is quarterback, tight end, and wide receiver. Obviously, we know biggest thing at quarterback Drake may is out. And that means Connor Harrell is going to be your starter with Jefferson Boaz as the backup who Jefferson Boaz is transferring. So I would imagine Connor Harrell is going to get the vast majority, if not all of the snack, I almost said snacks snaps at quarterback. Uh, the, the wackiest beyond that is tied in though. Remember Kamari Morales transfers out to BC. Uh, right now, John Copenhaver out with an injury. Nesbitt out with an injury. So you're looking at a totally fresh crop of tight ends. So looking at the tight end depth chart, you've got Deems May at the top, followed by Court Halsey and Cal Tierney. Um, my, my perhaps biggest question offensively for Carolina is how are they going to use the tight ends? Will they try to make these guys skill guys or will they more be blocking tight ends? And it's like, hey, Connor Harrell, you got Omari on Hampton. You got British Brooks and Caleb Hood. Let's just hand off the ball a whole bunch. But keep in mind, while the wide receiver starters are, are quite a bit different looking, and some of that's been because of injury, it's not, it's not all that dissimilar. It's all guys that have started. Uh, you've got Gavin Blackwell. You've got Nate McCollum, and you got J.J. Jones. Obviously, you wish you had Tez. That'd be great. But you, f- you feel good, you know, about being able to throw to these guys and, and letting them go make a play. You've got McCollum as a safety net underneath. You've got J.J. deep if, if they want to give Connor the opportunity to air it out some. Um, the, the thing is, though, Who's going to be the dude here? You know, I, I think this is a massive opportunity for Nate McCollum to make up for some of the drops he's had. Uh, you know, we know how frustrated he was with that. Um, and Nate Nate has had some big moments this season. Massive game. And behind them, I, I think it's an opportunity for some of the, re- the young guys to really show their chops. You got Chris Culliver, Christian Hamilton and Paul Billups as the twos behind all those starters. So um, interesting opportunities for the offense. We'll see what happens. Let me take you quickly through the defense and special teams. Along the defensive line, you got Des Evans at power end, Kevin Hester or Tamari Fox at nose. The three tech is Mile Murphy or Javari Ritzy. And then Cayman Rucker, who is coming back, baby, at the jack. Hopefully you did not get confused by Cayman's video on Friday and run off to tell all of your friends how Cayman Rucker was leaving before you watched the video all the way to the end because he's coming back. So, I mean, I feel good about the defensive line, just similar to the offensive line. That's maybe those, those upfront position groups is, is where you feel the best and most intact. Again, the depth behind it is an issue to watch. Linebacker, Power Eccles, great. But man, it's going to be weird not seeing 33 right beside 23, right? And so it's Amari Campbell going to be the starter alongside Power Echoes. So a little bit different there. We'll keep our eyes on how that goes. We know some guys have had breakouts in bowl games for Carolina. Think about uh, um, Asante, right? Like, whew. What, what a bowl game breakout he had a couple years ago. And then the secondary, the listed starters are Armani Chapman and Marcus Allen at cornerback, Stick Lane and Don Chapman at safeties, and then either Caleb Cost or DJ Jones at the start. As for special teams, Noah Burnett as your place kicker, Liam Boyd kickoff, Tom Maginus as the punter, and then kickoff return, Chris Culliver, punt return, Nate McCollum. So 
Um, all of those operations pretty well intact. We'll, we'll see special teams, you know, going to be critical. It's a bowl game with nothing to lose. I wouldn't be surprised to see some hijinks, some tomfoolery, if you'll allow me that, from both teams in the kicking game or, uh, you know, just various special team things. So keep your eyes peeled for that. All right, let's move again. We'll talk more about uh, the bowl game, setting it up and, and preparations for that on tomorrow's show on Wednesday. But today we want to move off of that and get into sharing a couple more Eric Montrose stories to wrap up the show and then um, give you our Trivia Tuesday answer. I want to keep sharing these Eric stories when they roll in because I, 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 we can't let this die. You know what I mean? We, we got to keep Big Grits alive. We got to keep him in our memories and part of the program and everything that's going on. So that's why I just want to make sure to keep sharing these when they roll in. So please, if you have stories, if you have friends that have stories or family, would love for you to send those in so we can share them. This first Eric Montrose story comes to us from Sam Hickman on Twitter DM. And he says this, I wanted to share a Montrose story, you, story with you that illustrates the kind of man he was. And Sam says this, quote, for most of my life, my family has lived in a beach town in southeastern North Carolina. Uh, Sam, I need to come visit or live with you because that sounds awesome. <laughs> Sam says it happens to be a beach where Eric Montross and his family visited frequently during and after his NBA playing days. We're talking mid to late 90s, somewhere in that time frame. There was an awesome burger hot dog joint right down the street from my house. So my family went there all the time. The owner of the burger joint was my dad's little league baseball coach. So our families were quite close. We had lunch on several occasions when Montross was in there with his wife, Mr. Sledge, the owner of the dog house got sick with cancer along the way. And my mother relayed the message to Eric during one of his dog house visits. You know where this is going. Just a few days later, Mr. Sledge received a care package at his home with handwritten letters from Eric Montross and Dean Smith. He recognized how much it would mean to Mr. Sledge, a lifelong Tar Heels fan, and our family has never forgotten that. Rest in peace, double zero. We love you, Sam. Whoo! It, it just continues to bewilder and befuddle me like the the brutal truth of the story of this man that has poured so much into caring for people with cancer ends up succumbing to it himself. Like I just, I can't with that, man. Sam, thank you so much for sharing your story. The other one, the second one today comes from the Landon Zone on the Locked on Tar Heels Discord. I love your name. It's so clever. Way to go, Landon. Also, it'd be great if your name was actually Landon Zone was your last name. How cool would that be, right? Anyway. Um, Landon says this quote, I didn't realize it before, but Eric Montross and I were the same age. Eric is probably one of my favorite all-time players at UNC. I got bit by the Tar Heel bug early on as my dad was an avid fan and would take us to Rams head Rath Skeller, uh, AKA the rat on Franklin street, at least once or twice a year, a highlight for my young self. My love for Tar Heel basketball grew as I learned more about Dean Smith. His coaching style based on the fundamentals and good defense and all the good things about college basketball drew me to him since that fit my personality pretty well. And that's why Eric Montross became one of my favorite players. He was fundamentally solid. As with so many players in the Dean Smith era, Eric was a solid and consistent player who didn't show a lot of emotion. But you knew that there was a fire inside of him because he played with such intensity. During Eric's years at UNC, my sister-in-law, who was 12 at the time, was absolutely in love with Mr. Eric Montross. She lived in Raleigh at the time and and lived Eric and excuse me. She lived in Raleigh at the time and lived Eric Montross in Tar Heels basketball. She actually wrote Eric a letter when she was 12, not really expecting to hear back. But to show the kind of character that Eric had even at that age, he wrote her back a really nice letter. My sister-in-law said it made me 12 years old. It made my 12-year-old life. I was so sad when I heard last March that he was diagnosed with cancer. It's a sad time in Tar Heel Nation right now as we mourn his loss, but I take great hope in seeing him again one day. 
As I learned of his faith, I look forward to meeting him in person and thanking him for the impact he has made on so many during his short time here on this earth. Definitely a role model for my life now and every 12-year-old out there. Hey, well said. Thank you, Big Grits, for giving so much to so many. That comes again excuse me, from the Landon Zone. Landon, thank you so much. What a great story to share. Let's wrap up today's show with our Trivia Tuesday answer. Once again, uh, we said Carolina has been a three seed on four different occasions in the NCAA tournament. Part A, what were those years? And bonus question, how did the Tar Heels fare in those four tournaments? So without much further ado, to quote Derek Zoolander, here are those four years, 1980, 1986, 1999, and 2006. Here's how they did in each of those years. And I'm here to tell you, it was not great. 1980, that was uh, that tournament had 48 teams. Carolina lost to Texas A&M in their first game, 78-61 to 61, in double overtime. Neither team scored in the first overtime. It, regulation ended at 53-53 as did the first overtime because Carolina went to the four quarters and four corners and basically just held the ball. But then in the second overtime, A&M outscored Carolina 25 to eight. Thanks to a like progression of the free throw line. How on earth do you lose a basketball game by 17 points in overtime? That's like losing uh, an extra innings baseball game by 10 or something like that. Wild stuff. Anyway, Carolina loses their 1986 Carolina beat Utah beat UAB, but then got blitzed by eventual national champion Louisville in the Sweet 16. 1999, Carolina lost to Weber, Weber State in the first round. And then in 06, I remember it well because this was spring of my senior year of college. Carolina beat Murray State, but then lost to that George Mason team that Jim Laranega took to the Final Four. So the answer, uh, Carolina overall as a three seed is three and four. So how did the Tar Heels do in those four tournaments? Not very well. Thank you very much. So actually, I said I'm hoping for Carolina to get a three seed. Let's maybe aim for something different. I would rather have a four seed uh, than, than have a three seed and do that. No, I'm just kidding. It'd be great to get a three seed and uh, change the narrative of those four tournaments. It's been great to be together today. Again, I hope you had an absolutely great Christmas with your family and friends and other loved ones. However, I recognize that that the season is not phenomenal for everyone. And for some of you, it's difficult. And I just want you to know that I'm, I'm praying for you. I stopped to do that on Monday and uh, because I know, again, it can be difficult and tough. So anyway, come join us in the Locked on Tar Heels Discord. We'd love to have you there. The link is in the show notes. You can email the show lockedontarheelsgmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, video and audio. Please, if you would, leave us a, a review and a rating. Five stars. Talk about why you love the show. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button so we know you were here. Hey, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Again, we'll be back with you tomorrow. But until then, peace.